today I will bring the series for chapter one to a close, which will be 22 messages in the first chapter of the book of Colossians. And I'm not saying that we're not going to continue on. I'm just simply saying this will kind of bring this first chapter to a close. We are looking at verses 24 through 29. And verse 24 through 29 is in the Greek is just one giant run-on sentence. There is no chapter and verse in the Greek in the oldest extant manuscript. So you've just got this one big giant verse, which is chapter and verse 24 through 29. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you and fill up that which is behind in the afflictions of Christ. We dealt with this already in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Whereof I am made a minister according to the dispensation of God, which is given to me for you, to fulfill the word of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, whereunto I also labor, striving according to his working, which worketh in me mightily. So I love what's being said here. I made a minister according to the economy of God. God knew exactly what was needed, which is given to me for you, to fully bring forth the full counsel of God, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but is now made manifest to his saints. Now you notice there's a semicolon there. It could be a colon. My eyes can't really see that sharply, but it doesn't end with a period. What I'm saying to you is each of these is just a run-on continuation. And what I want to talk about here briefly is this word mystery. You know, just to show you the ignorance of people who actually might have been a part of this ministry, I heard people say, you know, Dr. Scott, you know, he, he, taught, he taught the mysteries. Anybody who uses those phrases, you don't know how stupid you sound. Now, I'm going to explain in a minute, so you don't think I'm bashing on people, but there's, there's a certain something that when you've been around a ministry long enough, you'll, you'll have people toss around terms, and they think that those terms mean something when they actually mean something else. So let me explain to you. The word mystery, if we understand how Paul uses it, is not a mystery at all. Now, if you're studying words, as I do, I always start with etymology. And the etymology of this Greek word, the Greek word for mystery is musterion, And no, it's not the character on South Park. (laughs) Okay, then. You start with etymology. And from the Greek, you immediately see that this word could be related to a word, a root, muo, musterion, muo, which could mean to shut or close the mouth. Now, the reason why I point this out, there, there is a great cause for questioning the root of this word. So it's not, usually we're very clear, the Greek's very precise here, there's a little bit of a problem. But I would say, I have no problem using that definition, except, here's what happens. By the time Jerome is translating the Latin Vulgate, he takes the word, the Greek word, musterion, And he uses a word in Latin as basically the equivalent. The word he uses or he chooses is sacramentum. Not sacramento, sacramentum. You'll remember it now. Because, yes, sacramento could be very mysterious. But it's it's sacramentum. So you know if you're listening to the word, you hear sacrament in there. And it always bothered me why the Catholic Church has the concept of sacrament, and this mystery word. It just started kind of gelling in my mind 
that now we have really an explanation of a lot of things that I think a lot of people are very confused on, and I was for many years as well. So because of that use of the word sacramentum for mystery, we have an interpretation out of the Catholic realm that basically says that the sacraments essentially are, for them, are basically mysteries being brought forth, and we'll call them mysteries on a daily basis, if you will. But that is not, and never was, the meaning of the word. So to be clear, when when we use the word in, in English, a mystery is something that is unknowable. And a mystery can be something like a mystery that's unsolved, unsolvable, unknowable. That's a mystery. But when we understand how the Apostle Paul is using this, we realize that that is not at all how we should understand the word. And let me give an example. In the Old Testament, we have so many, if you want to use the word properly, they are shadows and types, but not the full revelation yet of Christ. Everything in the Old Testament, everything, has something to do with the person and the work and the nature of Christ, but not yet revealed. It took the coming of Christ in the flesh to make manifest. Christ, as I've said many times, was the exegesis of God. He put God on display in a tent of human flesh for us to see and recognize. So if we want to talk about what this mystery is, there are many mysteries referred to in the Bible, but a a good way to understand this is to, to first say the word is not strictly used We have it both in the New Testament. We also have the use in the Old Testament. And in the Old Testament, you'll find, in fact, the word, the occurrence and use of the word attests back to about the 7th century B.C. So when we encounter it, there's something very interesting. When we encounter the word, this mysterion word, in the Old Testament, here where some of the references are, and then it becomes a little bit more clear. For example, in the second chapter of Daniel, those are important chapters. Why? Because if you remember, if you're familiar with that passage, we have Nebuchadnezzar who has a dream and he's basically tormented by the fact that no one can say what the dream is and obviously Daniel is brought forth to interpret the dream. So there was first the dream that was unknowable, not to be not understood by anyone, not there was no interpretation. And then Daniel comes and he interprets the dream. He says, Let me tell you what this means, and begins to point out and make clear. So the the word mystery is used there, and the same type of use is used, for example, in Revelation 120, where the seven stars and the seven messengers, it's, it's an explanation of what was first seen. So like much like Nebuchadnezzar's dream, where he dreams the dream and then there's an interpretation and somebody has to unfold the interpretation, Revelation 120, the mystery there is the same thing. Let me show you, because I'm not sure I have some people looking at me like uh, deer in the headlights here. I want to make sure you understand what I'm saying. Turn to Revelation 120 so I can give the demonstration so we're, we're all on the same page here. So, Revelation 1.20 says, The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. The vision was seen earlier, right? Then it is made clear by the interpretation. That is the way we need to understand the way mystery is being used. Not mystery as in woo, right? Not in a lot like that. So it's important to grab hold of that. You find, you will find if you study the apocalyptic literature, specifically Enoch, the raptured seer has more revelations of God's mysteries given to him I mean, it's almost, 
if you read, and if you're reading Enoch, it's kind of almost an unbelievable read as you, you're looking at this word and you keep encountering what was revealed to him. It's kind of mind-boggling. And then after that, you can move into the Qumran literature, and you'll find that there is an important part there of mysteries, but in the Qumran community, they basically said, and the teacher of righteousness will need to basically reveal these mysteries. Now, if they intended the teacher of righteousness to be Christ, then Christ revealed himself and the word. I'm not sure that was the intent, but if that is, that is the way I would take it. In the New Testament, the word occurs 27 times, 20 times by the Apostle Paul. But I'd like to show you the occurrences, three occurrences which are all the same in the Gospels. In let's just say we'll use Matthew 13. So if you want to turn there, and we can look at how it's being used. And this is important because you have it only three times in the Gospels, And here we have, so Matthew 13 is the parable of the sower. And obviously, Jesus is speaking and he basically is giving these, we'll call them breadcrumbs of different types of uh, soil. And then if you read through that, And you get to the 11th verse. He answered them and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven. But to them it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given. He shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Now, the reason why he says basically these people can't hear or they can't receive or they can't understand. But these are also people who basically would not They would not take the words of Christ like the disciples did, even though they were, we'll call it, uh, early faithing and doubting, which would be perfectly normal. There were those who would not. So basically, Jesus is saying to those who will not hear my words, the mystery is given to you, disciples, to understand. But to those people, it's not given. They will not understand. They will not receive. They will not understand. It will not make sense to them. So... The first thing we can know is that Jesus' use of the word mystery, when he says it is given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, well, here is the Lord of glory speaking to his disciples, revealing the word to them. So we cannot assume in any way, shape, or form that at least in Matthew 13, Mark 4, and Luke 8, that these have any references to anything that is hidden knowledge that will never be made known to other people. We can't, we can't go there. We can only say if, if a person is trusting the Lord, is faithing, then this knowledge is made available for those people to receive. Does that make sense? Good. Okay. So kind of a shell game here. Okay. If we follow, because I'd like to show the example so that we can dispel some ideas of what I call plain stupidity about understanding this word mystery. If I were to take you to, I want to go to Paul's use of the word, but I want to look at references outside of Paul's writing first before I go to, to into Paul's writing, because he uses it the most and is most clear. There's nothing ambiguous about what I'm going to say here on this word. So before I go to Paul, let me just use the references out of Revelation. I've already mentioned Revelation 120. I'm sorry to make you go back and forth, but I'm, I'm sure it, it won't hurt your, your arms to turn the pages. I know it's a lot of work there, turning the pages. It's very difficult. In Revelation 10 and 7, where it says, In the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. So we have here a very clear understanding that in 10.7, the trumpet call of the seventh angel signifies the mystery of God has been fulfilled. 
you have it again, the use of the word again. And, and let me just wait, before I move on from here, let me just say this. This basically, the mystery of God should be finished, is saying that all that God has planned for this final chapter of what's happening on earth, for God's desire for the things that must happen, will be finished. So you cannot think of this as the mystery of God in some kind of out there way. It's exactly what it's basically saying. When the mystery of God's plan, God's will, God's instruction should be finished. That's just all it's saying right there, nothing more. You turn to the 17th chapter. In the 17th chapter, at the 5th verse, we have here this Mystery Babylon, the great harlot, the mother of harlots and abomination of the earth. And again, it will appear in verse 7, the mystery of the woman. These two references here are probably, I would say, standalone in that they do not reference. All the other references to mystery will have to do with Christ. Christ, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, these are, these are references that have to do with, obviously, the antithesis of what we are looking at. We talk about God's plan. This is, this is still part of God's plan, but it's, we'll call it the, the evil that must be rooted out, manifested and rooted out before we have the recreation period of the earth. So just to kind of make that plain, those are the things outside of Paul's writing. But when you get into Paul's writing, the reason why I want to do this is to show you, to be very clear, that when we use the word mystery, or sometimes in the plural, mysteries, we're not talking about things that are like space-age stuff. Like, you know, like I said, I've heard many people uh, talk about things that Dr. Scott said or that he taught on, and they like to refer to these things as mysteries. Well, there are certain natural or supernatural mysteries, I agree. But if you're talking about biblical mysteries, these are not the same. Don't compare UFOs mysteries to Bible mysteries because the things of the Bible have actually been revealed to us and the scripture makes clear what is being spoken of. So let's look at a few of the references from the Apostle Paul's use of the word beginning in Romans. He uses it at Romans 11.25 when he says, For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits that the blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Because he goes on to say, And so all Israel shall be saved. Here is the mystery the use of the word mystery here, the mystery of Israel's present hardness of heart, which Paul basically says will have future deliverance. See, a lot of people don't understand the relationship between Israel. We have here two things being referenced. Paul, who was sent to minister to the Gentiles, but he also did minister, there's no doubt about it, to the Jewish community as well. But we've got something that a lot of people, even in this day and age, don't understand, which is there's a plan for God's people. And what Paul is saying here is just because God turned his back momentarily, when I use the word momentarily, we're talking about generations, where God basically chose these people, these people would not trust him, take him at his word. And so he turned to another people, the, the ethnon, the Gentiles. And this is basically the time of the Gentiles until the time of the Gentiles is fulfilled. And when we come to the end, basically, if you want to talk about the last seven years and split those last seven years that are spoken of through Daniel and Revelation, you find very clearly that there will be people who will be gospelizing, if you want to call it that, or evangelizing, and there will be a mixed community of people that will be ministered to. But most certainly, if you think about it, the 144,000 preachers of righteousness, 
And, you know, there's a lot of confusion. Well, are, are all of those people going to be preaching to a certain group of people? No, I believe it's for a diversity of the nations. All ethnicities basically will call it the final sweep on earth or the last call before God says, that's it, I'm done, and so is earth. So, so much for saving the planet, too, but that's another subject. <laughs> now, if you want to save the planet, friend, knock yourself out probably be a better investment of your time than all the other stupid things that people concentrate on, but not for God. God says, I'm going to destroy it anyway, so waste your time. But anyway, listen, you know, if you don't believe what the Bible says, then you're not wasting your time. In Romans 16, 25, he says, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the beginning, since the world began, but now is made manifest and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. This mystery, Jesus Christ. See, this is why sometimes you hear people toss around terms. The way Paul uses it, there's really only... We'll call it maybe three or four ways to approach this word. The first one at the top of Paul's list is the mystery. Because, it, it, you know, we, we don't necessarily focus on this in our time, but in Paul's day, it would have been an issue. See, the Jews could not figure out. Those who, who heard the gospel and basically were changed by it and began to follow Christ, they could not imagine, because they had been through the steps of the law, circumcision, and you keep going, how a Gentile could come in and not have any exterior physical rituals to go through and not have to go through anything else. How could that, how is that possible? That's what plagued the early church and a big faction of that Jewish community that was incredibly resentful to the Gentiles being able to come in. Now think back to all the parables that Jesus spoke about, about the first and the last, and you can see clearly that he knew this would also be an issue. So kind of interesting, for Paul, the first mystery, and it's the mystery that's heralded the most, in fact, it'll be the highest concentration of these references to mystery in the book of Ephesians, has to do with the mystery of how God would save Jew and Gentile, tearing down the wall of partition that separated us and bringing us together as one in the body of Christ. That was, at the top of Paul's list, a mystery, not a mystery that was unknowable and undiscoverable, but a mystery made clear in the person of Jesus Christ. So, again, you begin to see you get clarity on the use of the word. If you leave Romans and go to 1 Corinthians 2.7, you have another instance right there, and here the focus, the mystery, is equated with the wisdom of God. Let me start at verse 6. He says, How be it we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of this world that come to naught, but we speak the wisdom... Of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known that they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. So here, the mystery here goes back to the wisdom of God. Well, let me tell you a thing about the wisdom of God. If you if you search out the wisdom of God and you go back into the Old Testament and you look at the wisdom of God, for example, in Proverbs, it is the personification of of God. So again, we, we don't have something that's unknowable and not understandable. It's being, it, it's made clear right there in the text. So how someone could not understand this, and if you're still not clear, read down in verse 10. But God hath revealed, revealed them unto us by his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yea, the deep things of God. So these things are given to us to know by God. They're not mysteries where some people 
know and some people don't know. Now, if you were looking up this word mystery, in antiquity, that's the way in the Greek cults specifically that would be used. The initiates of the cult would have secret, hidden, cryptic knowledge that non-initiative initiates would not have the luxury of knowing. That is not the way Christianity works. That's how the Dark Ages, that's how the church worked in the Dark Ages, where you had the clergy who had their little, their little bubble of, if they really had a bubble of knowledge. Think, think about something. I mean, it's a mystery that the church actually survived. It's a miracle. When you think about through the Dark Ages, Middle and Dark Ages, how even the clergy... Some of the clergy didn't read, yet they had one, one handwritten copy of something, and the vast majority, not, I'm not saying all, but the vast majority were illiterate. So what do you think sermons and homilies would be made up out of? Poof, the thought bubble. Well, today we're going to talk about whatever it is, but it's not necessarily what's relevant to your salvation, to get the point. In 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 1, the Apostle Paul says, Let a man so account of us as of the ministers of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. So, again, it's a stewardship. Remember, all of what I've said this whole time I've been speaking has to do with understanding the balance of things. We talk about Paul saying, I made a minister, the balance of things that must be respected in terms of the things of God. And here he says that the ministers of Christ must be stewards of the mysteries of God. That means to me it is anyone's responsibility who is called to stand to make sure that these mysteries, which there is only actually one, is being presented week in and week out. And that is, in some way, shape, or form, the person of Christ, the teaching of Christ, the message of Christ, the mind of Christ, the work of Christ. This is what is necessary and required. But let's keep going because there's, there's more to this. It's kind of interesting The use, you can see clearly there are some subcategories, but keep going till you get to 1 Corinthians 13. And you should know this is the famous passage on the priority of love. And he says, Though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and I have, though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but I have not. King James says charity, but it's love. I am nothing. So here, again, interesting, this has to do with the demeanor of what, when we receive knowledge of God, our demeanor. And this is something, I'm I'm only going to say this one thing here, you do what you want with it. I find a lot of people like to listen and maybe even read. Now, I'm not suggesting that you try to change yourself or do something to yourself, but to be open enough to understand that when you're reading these things, think about this. I have the gift of prophecy and understand all the mysteries. If God granted me all, every every gift, but I don't have love, and he's using the word agape, that is uncalculated, unconditional, that type of love that's no strings attached. If I don't have that, I'm nothing tells you that these mysteries aren't something of a Simon the Sorcerer. I, I have my little thing over here, and I can't let you see it, because if, if I show you my secrets, then, you know, you, you, you understand? It's not like that. But yet I've heard people, including people formerly from this ministry, use the word just like that in a very erroneous way that makes it sound like this is something that's cloaked, that can't be known. The word is not being used like that. It never has been, and it never will be, period. If you move forward, there's another couple in 1 Corinthians, but I'm just going to take you to the last one in 1 Corinthians, which occurs in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 51. 
Now watch, here's another pattern of what I was saying earlier. He says, behold, I, will sh- I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. I will show you a mystery. And then he goes on to elaborate in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. And he goes on to elaborate even more. Now, if it's a mystery that's unknowable and undiscernible and un, everything un, 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 how can he say, I will show you, and then goes on to explain to the best that we can understand how things will happen? He explains it. So is it still a mystery? The mystery is still somehow that God chose me and he chose you. That's a mystery. The mystery is that why me? And I don't, 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 don't take that as in go somewhere else. I'm just saying, why me? And maybe not somebody else. Or why, you know, we can keep asking the questions. But you understand what I'm trying to say here. Let's go to the last example before I get into my text. My last example here is in Second Thessalonians. So you'll find that just a bit over from Colossians. Colossians and 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. So, 2 and at 2.7. And this is so marked up, I can barely read it. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he, be, until he be taken out of the way. And this refers, obviously, the mystery of iniquity is referring to that spirit of Antichrist That is already at work in the land. There is no doubt about it. And I've kind of treated this passage very delicately, but this may stand alone in that we're talking about the mystery of lawlessness and the things basically that are going away from the things of God to culminate in basically the last events on earth. So we could say these... The things I've just referenced out of Thessalonians may still be vague, but yet not ambiguous, because if you want to know about this, you can go into other books and begin reading about this and learning about this as well. That's why I said to you, we can't take something and say, it's a mystery, if we can know about it. it. It is not a mystery as we understand it, or as we use the word. Now, if I take you to... To take you back to Colossians, and let's look at our text, because I want to speak a little bit about what's in the text. So, 26 and 27 of the first chapter, even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this Mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Here, it's abundantly clear. We're not talking about a future event like Second Thessalonians. We're talking about present salvation. And he changes the way, you know, t- very typical Pauline statement, in Christ. You are in Christ. But he, here he says, Christ in you. And I want to stop and and kind of think about this and how to understand when he says this mystery. As I said, it it is kind of mind-boggling, and it could be considered a mystery. Why did God choose me, or why did God choose you, or why, 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 why? But probably, if you look at it, 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 it kind of gets a little bit more clear in the second chapter when he says that their hearts might be comforted being knit together in love and all the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And this I say, lest any man should beguile you with enticing words. So you begin to think about something. You begin to think about the fact that we should very carefully treat this word mystery in Colossians with a mindset that the mystery is unveiled and made manifest, who is Christ. And recognize that right there within our text, we can know something. The people that came into this church at Colossae had planted enough misinformation and planted enough false 
good news. Doesn't that sound familiar? Fake good news, right? Had planted enough of it to get the people at Colossae confused, which is why his statement, Christ in you, the hope of glory, is reminding all of these people. See, you can treat the statement, which is beautiful, Christ in you, the hope of glory, you can say it in in the mindset of these people thinking, well, maybe I'm not part of the church and maybe I'm not part of this body. Christ in you. I mean, don't just take it as an application of words on paper. He's saying Christ in you, Christ abiding in you. Like I've said many times, when we abide in him, he abides in you. This concept is, not, is no longer a mystery. The mystery has been revealed to us by him, not by Paul. I'm talking about by God. So it's important to understand how we should take this word. And yes, in the Old Testament dispensation, there were people who maybe desired, for example, take the prophets. The prophets came and they kept their... The message of the prophets was a message that nobody wanted to hear. Repent, turn back to God, turn back before it's too late. God has a message for you. It's not too late. No one would listen. No one would listen. No one would listen. God was trying to convey the message through the prophets, through all of these people. Yet now he says, and is made manifest. In other words, now is the time. There is no more. This is a mystery. We can't understand it. Who can know? Now, I want to take you to one more place, and then we'll come back to our text, which is the book of Ephesians, because single-handedly, the greatest amount of references of this word are in the book of Ephesians, and I think while we're here, we might as well look at them. That will give us a little bit more help and understanding of the force of this word. So in Ephesians 1, and he uses it in verse 9, when he says, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure with he, which he hath purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things. Again, it is a repetition. So you cannot get to this word and think this is something unknowable. The mystery of his will, which we have as we read the Old and New Testament. They are basically God's last words to us, the whole book. The third chapter, we have another reference there, In the third chapter, I'll read beginning at verse 1, but it's verse 3, the focus. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if ye have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote before in a few words, let me just say this, and he received the revelation of the mystery of Christ, but he wasn't taught it by any man. And he says that clearly several times. He received it of God himself. This is the mystery that Paul is communicating to anyone who will listen, but it's certainly not hid. And it's not something cryptic that we can't know or understand. If you keep reading verses 4 and 5 there, he says, whereby when you read, that ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. Do you see, I'm saying the same thing in a different way because this is what Paul is saying in a different way, but he's saying the same thing. The mystery is, first and foremost, salvation in Christ the mind-boggling thing that almost even today is grappled with, how, how can a person be saved by something that happened 2,000, over 2,000 years ago? The second mystery is that God says, no more Jew and no more Gentile, just like the second or third mystery attached to that could be no more Jew, no more Gentile, no, nor male, nor female, nor Greek, nor barbarian, but he says, all one in Christ Jesus. Now, if that sounds like a mystery to you, as something unknowable, then I'm not speaking English. It's not something unknowable, and it's not something hidden. It has been set forth as plain as day. Now, 
I could keep going on this, but there is one last reference that has probably sums up for me everything that I'd want you to know about this mystery. And that is in, out of 1 Timothy 3. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it to you. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 16. He says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, flesh justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. So I don't think you can get anything out of this word except the understanding that what was previously not revealed in the days of old has been revealed to us in the person and work of Christ. That basically is the mystery. Now, you move on to that, and then the big question begins. Because there'll, there'll be people who, as I've just said, will think, I'm saying, this is my opinion, or the Bible says very clearly about what will happen to the Jews in a future time. All you've got to do is read the end of Zechariah. That's in, I say it this way, I mean, no disrespect, that's in their scriptures. That's in the Old Testament when it says, they shall look upon him whom they've pierced and mourn. They will know. At some point in a future time, they will know that the same Jesus that came in the flesh, the one that returned, he is Lord and Savior of all. At this particular time, there is no capability unless God is preveniently working in the lives of those folks. No way for them to look and see and taste and see that the Lord is good. In this respect, for them, you talk to somebody who's of the Jewish faith and they might say, well, maybe he lived, maybe he existed. Or if you're in the more religious circles, you don't even mention the name of Christ. That is forbidden among the very ultra-Orthodox Jews. You don't mention the name of Jesus Christ. Should it roll off your lips, it would be like a stain in the air. But the Bible clearly says over and over, and I, I could quote from different places, but Zechariah is the one that's the clearest. They will be forced to look on him and see. And there is definitely in the book of Revelation a clear understanding that God is going to gather up like the final harvest just as the day of Pentecost began, threw open the floodgates for the ministry and the church to begin, there will be a final Pentecost, a harvest of souls, that one last time on the earth, which those 144 preachers of righteousness will gather up. That is after the restraining force that has basically kept the spirit of Antichrist at bay is removed, which is what Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians says. And when that happens... Everything else kind of is unleashed. There'll be that final, as I said, last call. And there will be a combination of Jew and Gentile who will respond. Now, what that number is and who those people are, I don't know. But when you get back into our text, the thing that I really want to point out, and I want to kill it to where if you read, you encounter the word mystery, you are not thinking of something that is cryptic or... Uh, like hieroglyphic in nature where you have to figure this thing out. If you're reading the Bible, plain as day, the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man, teaching every man. And I want to pause right on those two words, warning and teaching. This is a huge issue with ministers. It's huge. And I'm going to tell you why. You either have people who do too much warning so that you just want to stay away, right? Or you have people who do no warning at all. You have people who will not teach and therefore people cannot learn and they cannot grow spiritually. Sorry, there is no way for you to grow spiritually except you are feeding on the word and receiving teaching. You could grow, you could still grow by praying and reading and doing your own studies, but I'm sorry, it doesn't happen by osmosis. And what you have here when it says we preach warning every man, teaching every man, I don't think the type of preacher that Paul was 
I don't think that he went into a church or wrote to a church with the intent of perverse, you know, I'm going to be a killjoy and you, you, you shouldn't do that and you don't do that and, and, and you don't do that and you over there certainly don't do that. That wasn't the motive of when he says warning every man, but warning every individual who will listen of the perils of the life without faith in Jesus Christ. Warning anyone who will listen. And trust me, I do know this firsthand, and it's, sometimes it's, it is heartbreaking. I try to not show my emotions on this particular subject too much because it affects me deeply. Of people who, they could have the gospel presented to them, and it would be like they had the greatest filet mignon, whatever your favorite food that's considered gourmet for you presented, and they turn their nose at it like, no, I'm, I'm good, I don't need it. Or medicine for a sickness that you know you absolutely, if you don't take it, you're going to die. No, I'm okay, I feel good enough without it. The lack of understanding, and this is why I have stood here for these 22 weeks now, seemingly sounding some type of an alarm, that if ministers, I'm not talking to you parishioners right now, I'm talking to ministers who listen to me, it's your responsibility to open up and preach the full counsel of God. That doesn't mean we condemn. Who am I? Who am I to condemn anyone when I stand in the same place as you all, a sinner being saved by grace? But there's a paradox, and the paradox is, if we're reading something, it can't just be that we read and we don't take account to process mentally. What does this mean for me? And again, at the sake of being redundant here, if we are going to take the Bible and do what we do every single week here, which is open it up and dissect it, there has to be a point where we're processing the information. And this is why when he says we preach, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom, And there's a reason for it, that we may present every man perfect or complete in Christ. So I want you to think about what the work, I often point out what your work might be, but the work of the minister in ministry. And it is a one singular work. So I'll say this for the people who are listening who may not tune in again, and you say, well, I need to find a church. Faith Center is not the place for me. Well, that's fine. Find a place where someone is going to teach you and instruct you and not warn you as in, I'm interfering in your life and telling you don't do this and don't do that. Warning you. Read carefully what's said here. That we may present every man perfect, that means complete, as a finished work in Christ Jesus. Now, I'm not doing the presentation. My work here is to make sure I'm giving all the information. I'm putting it out there. Now, let me give you some scenarios. The information's put out there. You have people that receive the information. They process it. It's not going through their brain filter and making it come out the way they want. They're receiving it. They may actually go back. They may study. They may revisit. You've got other people who hear. It goes through their filter. They spin it around, and it becomes the version of what they want it to be. You've got people who hear, but do not listen. Therefore, they do not receive. Therefore, the root cannot, the word cannot take root and penetrate. And then you've got the people that just say, eh, that's not for me. When you pass down these categories, you begin to understand why he says his, the point here is to present every man finished, complete in Christ. And there's only one way to do that. Preach the whole counsel of God. Stay with the book. We're not into social justice or racial or the, Issues of the day that, honest to God, if every minister standing in a pulpit today in America would just preach the word of God, let the world be the world. The world will continue to be the world. It will continue to be degenerate. It will continue to be disrespectful. It will continue on its course because that is the course that it's on to its destruction and demise. And you can either figure out you're going through that very broad gate or you've elected in your mind to go through the narrow gate, and that narrow gate requires, as the Apostle Paul, and I I like his pastoring style, even though he may have never seen these folks in person, to present 
every man complete in Christ. Whereunto I also labor, striving. That word is the same word we see elsewhere, agonizing according to his working, laboring, striving, agonizing according to his working, which worketh mightily in me. The one thing that I admire about the Apostle Paul, he didn't let his circumstance, he didn't let the situation, he didn't let the, even the people who came to interfere quell his passion for preaching and teaching, warning, and the desire to do just that, present every man with a mission in mind, and I, this is why I love the Bible. It's very, very clear. He doesn't say, look, I'm going to teach you a hobby. Come, come, to, come to hear the Apostle Paul. Come to hear my messages, and I'm going to teach you how to play the guitar. <laughs> well, I'm going to teach you how to make the best latte you ever had. And then we can kick back, and you might want to listen while you sip on it. You're not saying that. He's saying, this is the nitty-gritty of ministry, striving and laboring. And if any, I'm going to do it again. If any minister out there is listening to me, it is your responsibility. This is what you will be held accountable for. This is what I will be held accountable for. To come and to instruct. To come and to open up the word of God. To come and to be faithful. Remember, I quoted another passage, 1 Corinthians 4, verses 1 and 2. To be a steward, a custodian, someone who will take good care, who's trustworthy of the gospel, the mystery, or the, if you want to call it the mystery of the word of God, or the, the mystery of the ministry of the word of God, and bring forth the word of God. So it is imperative that this, we leave this chapter with kind of a footnote. And the footnote is, when people say, well, we can't know, we don't understand, we can. There's, no, there's nothing hidden anymore. If there's something that I could say remains not hidden, but slightly veiled, Paul does say we see through a glass darkly. We filter everything through our carnal, finite eyes and minds. So yes, in that respect, there are certain things that we cannot actually fully receive, but to the ability to the extent that we're able to read and glean from the scriptures, we're able to know. So the next time you hear somebody talking about the mysteries of God, oh, <laughs> you mean about Jesus Christ? Is that what you're all excited about? Is that what you're, you're rubbing your hands about? Because if you're rubbing your hands about Christ, I'll rub mine with you and we'll be two real happy people. But my point to you today in bringing this first chapter to a close I think when we look at the scriptures, there's a very plain and clear message, and that is the church of Jesus Christ was designed to build men and women learners, and just as the Great Commission teaching and preaching, still is the Great Commission today to this day teaching and preaching whatsoever Jesus Christ had taught his disciples. The Apostle Paul brings his wealth of knowledge I and others like me should be putting this information forth and you as people hearing and receiving. This is my only commentary I'll say as a little editorial sidebar. It can't be that we hear something and we don't at least spend some time reflecting on what it means. I think a lot of times I speak, I present something, and it could be something that's, it could be considered research or it's analysis, but I'm not sure that we stop long enough to pause and ask ourselves, what exactly does this mean? And for me, when I pause on this, there are several things I glean. I understand that I'm doing what I'm called to do, which is teaching and preaching, opening up the word of God, striving and laboring, just as Paul did, that we all have a responsibility to not be ignorant and play this, we're waiting for a special revelation. Sorry, there is no special revelation except for the revelation we have. And the mystery that Paul refers to is indeed something to ponder. Christ in you. Can you imagine? I know it, it's, we say this so often that it maybe doesn't have an impact, but can you imagine what this means when he says Christ in you? Yes, the Spirit lives in me. God actually 
took up residence to take up a tent of human flesh while he walked the earth and had his public ministry. Now God chooses to take up, in, in part, residence in this tabernacle, in this clay house. And for what reason, I can't even understand, except it is a mystery to me, but it's a wonderful mystery, not an unknowable one. But it's a mystery, nonetheless, that he came and he chose me and he chose you, that he would basically put himself on display through each of these containers. That's pretty radical. And when you think about it, when Paul says, Christ in you, he's saying, hey, you have an anchor of the soul. Don't be, as he told the Galatians, tossed with every new wind of doctrine and every new idea. Stay the course. Your anchor is Christ. Stay fixed on him. You will not lose your way. I'm going to tell you this chapter for me could become a whole basic Christianity 101 for people who are still trying to figure it out and for those of us who are wrestling through the scriptures, a wonderful reminder that we should be very diligent and vigilant to protect the church from ever coming or becoming something that God did not deign it to be. Not an entertainment place, a learning place, a place that brings glory and honor to his name where we gather with one mind in one accord for one purpose, and that one purpose today, I believe, has been accomplished in presenting this message to you, which is not a mystery that's hidden, but one that I will boldly proclaim until I have no more breath in my lungs. Jesus Christ came to save sinners like me and like you, and that mystery that was once hidden has been made manifest as plain as day so that I can say, I may have the outlook of the world that says bleak, sorrowful, but I have this certain hope. And this hope is not hope in hope. It's hope in the fact that what Christ said as a promise is granted to me for my simple faith. I will be with him as he is with me now. I will be with him and I will be with him in eternity just as you will be too. I can't think of a greater hope that we could have in spite of all the craziness day to day that we go through. Let that be the anchor of your soul. Christ with you today and with you clear to the end. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number that is 800-338-3030 to join us. If you'd like to watch, listen, and learn 24 hours a day, simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.